Okay, so, yeah, so I'm definitely going to have to, unless Carrie wants me to photograph a group of graduates. Okay, everybody, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, I want to get us started um, uh, this morning with our keynote presentation um, for the for the conference, and I am uh, very um, uh, excited to present um, Michelle Weiss um, as our keynote uh, speaker today. Um, Paula Blanc, um, unfortunately, as as I mentioned, um, is ill and sends his regards to everyone, and has sent Michelle Weiss um, in his place. Um, and we're very, very happy uh, to have you, um, and very. Um, uh, appreciative of all of the, um, you know, efforts uh, to get you here, <laughs> uh, and um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about Michelle. And I did post, um, I updated the keynote uh, web page that um, gives you her bio and an abstract of her presentation. So if you want to check that out, I'm not going to read it to you, but I did want to mention um, that um, uh, Michelle. Um, comes from academia, uh, also from ed tech, and she was, let me get this right, um, a senior research fellow in higher education at the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation. Um, and, um, I, you know, that without any further ado, I'm just going to pass it over to you, Michelle. Thank you very much for coming. All right, let's see. Can you hear me? Does that work? Okay, perfect. We'll kind of wander a little bit. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not Paul J. LeBlanc. Um, I, uh, the good news is for you that I spend a lot of time with him, and uh, I also know that what he was going to talk about today, and so I'm going to try to incorporate a fair amount of what he was thinking about talking about with you into this into this little talk, um, and then we'll also try to leave some time for questions and answers um, afterwards. But um, so one of the interesting things about what Paul has done, and it's one of the reasons why I moved from the Christensen Institute to Southern New Hampshire University, is because he actually took Clayton Christensen's theories of disruptive innovation and used them as a playbook for innovation at Southern New Hampshire University. <clears throat> and so I'm going to just spend a little bit of time kind of going through what disruption really is, because the term is bandied about so recklessly in the press and by pundits. And what happens often is that, <clears throat> as many of you know, because you all work in online ed, uh, people will see something new and fancy and something that's maybe called adaptive learning technology, something that sounds very cool. And then they'll think that that seems to be some sort of disruption from the norm. And so then they'll say, <clears throat> that must be some sort of disruptive innovation, because it's an innovation that seems to be disrupting the status quo. It's not at all what happens. And so what I want to go through is, what it takes to call something a disruptive innovation, what we see as having disruptive potential in the marketplace of higher ed, um, and how we can use these theories as a lens to kind of scan the horizon uh, in terms of what's going on in the work that we do. So just briefly, this is sort of the best uh, succinct definition of a disruptive innovation. It's a process by which a product or service takes root initially in the bottom of the marketplace and then relentlessly moves up sort of is eventually displacing established competitors. And so what people often think is that disruption is about technology. And it is really not. It has to have the right customers, the right business model, and the right technology. Technology is important, but it is only an enabler. It is not the be all and end all of, of what we can call a disruptive innovation. And so really, um, when we think about how this relates to higher education, what has happened in higher ed is that we have, we have consistently had what we call sustaining innovations. These are what we do in order to provide better products and services for our best students, for the students that we currently serve. And so we, we create more and more of these sorts of sustaining innovations to compete with our peer institutions, to uh, maintain where we are with accreditation management. And we relentlessly kind of move up market in this way. A disruptive innovation really comes in at a very different angle and again comes in at the bottom of the marketplace and targets uh, and makes something that used to be quite expensive and inaccessible, affordable and accessible to a whole new population of people. 
people whom we call non-consumers. And non-consumers are, this is really important because it gets at this idea of what it means to you know, inject yourself in the bottom of the marketplace. These are non-consumers, people for whom the alternative is really nothing at all. So here's how we exactly identify a disruptive innovation. We, again, have to have this convergence of these sort of six things that I'm gonna lay out for you. The first is, is the innovation targeting people who are non-consumers, people who are overserved by existing products? So one way to think about this, who are the non-consumers of higher ed? We could count them as the 71% of non-traditional students. These are, these are people who are not taking that residential college campus uh, education that we tend to glorify, right? These are 71% of the college-going population uh, now counts as this misnomer, which is non-traditional. NCES predicts that by 2020, 42% of all college students will be over the age of 25. There, a couple of years ago, the UCLA SERP survey found that 87.9% of college fresh, freshmen cited getting a better job as the main reason why they were pursuing a college degree. And that was 17 points higher <clears throat> than just a few, early, a few years earlier. McKinsey has this incredible statistic where in less than a three-year period, they estimate that the number of skill sets needed in the workforce went from 178 to 924. So getting at this idea that we have this emerging knowledge economy and we are not, well, and we are not equipping our students well for these kinds of changing times. And at the same time, we have about 91 million Americans with high school and or some college who could stand to benefit from an alternative credential in their lives. So these, are, these would be the people that we, we might count as the folks who are non-consumers of higher education. Uh, and I was, just, I was just sort of overhearing uh, the speaker before talking about how her online experience was her only option, right? And so again, it gets, it gets at that idea of these are people for whom the alternative is really nothing at all. And that's where we get to the second question, which is really important. Is the innovation not as good <clears throat> as, excuse me, <clears throat> as existing products or uh, that are judged by historical measures of performance? So I'm just going to remove ourselves from higher education just for one moment and step inside to a business analogy because sometimes it helps to sort of take, out, take ourselves out of the situation in which we are entrenched to sort of understand what this means. And it'll get at this idea of not as good or just good enough. If you take, and this is really how the whole theory of disruption emerged. Clayton Christensen was writing his doctoral dissertation. He was trying to understand why it's so difficult for organizations to sustain success. And so he realized, if we just sort of imagine generally that most modern industries, we can describe them with these sort of series of concentric circles. And in that centermost circle, you can imagine that with any product or service, you can measure, it, uh, measure the performance of a product or, ser or service over time. And so what happens is, generally, companies tend to improve their products in this way, where they're trying to make better products for their best customers. And these can be really incremental innovations that help them move up market, or they can be breakthrough dramatic technological innovations that help them you know, drive better profit. The problem is with sustaining innovations, this is what we call sustaining innovations, that pace of technological progress will at some point outstrip the customer's ability to actually take advantage of that progress. So the way to think about this is in 1982, uh, when uh, we had the Intel 286 chip, which, which was the world's fastest chip, it was the world's fastest processor, and yet people could barely type and do simple, process, simple tasks like word processing. The, the keyboard would kind of have to catch up to the cursor. Or sorry, the cursor would have to catch up to, the, to what you were doing with your fingers. Now if you take a look, that would be described by where the red line is on top of the blue line. If you take a look now at your computers, your tablets, your cell phones that you use, you probably only use maybe about 15% a fraction of what that processor actually can offer to you. And that's where the blue outstrips the red, where the blue is on top of the red. And the reason why this is important is there just becomes a point where at some point the customer is sort of overserved by what you are delivering to them. And that's why disruptive innovations can kind of take hold in the marketplace. 
they start delivering a product or a service on a very different me <coughs> measure of performance. And so the, um, the typical example we tend to use is that when personal computers first started emerging on the market, they were actually, Apple actually made a deliberate choice to target hobbyists and children with their initial um, PCs. And the reason why that was important is because children had nothing to compare the personal computer to. So they were delighted by this very crummy machine. People like Digital Equipment Corporation, who are making some of the best mini computers of the time, these are computers that were the size of a podium. They were delivering amazing um, capabilities to people who were doing computer-aided design systems, laboratory controlling, all kinds of sort of high-level computing tasks. When digital equipment asked their customers, what is it that you want? Do you want us to build you a personal computer? The customers said, no, don't build me a personal computer. They're absolute crap. I, I need you to build me a faster mini computer, a better performing mini computer. I will pay you more for that more expensive, better performing mini computer. Apple, on the other hand, targeted these hobbyists, the children, um, and those, those non-consumers were delighted with the product. And so the way this correlates to higher ed is that whenever I mention that sort of online technology and the sort of first wave of disruption emerged when places like University of Phoenix arrived on the scene, people tend to immediately have kind of a, a negative reaction and they say, University of Phoenix delivers nothing like what we deliver on our campus. Like, how can you bring up something that is delivering an inferior product or service compared to what it is that we do at our nonprofit institution? And the whole thing about disruption is it doesn't measure up to our existing measures of performance. As you remember in that sort of graph, we push out on the Z axis, and that Y axis is a totally different measure of performance. So it's not, we don't measure quality in the same way that we would in a campus-based experience. And so what that first wave of disruption did was it enabled students who were working, who had life getting in the way of their pursuit of a degree, to not step out of their jobs, and be able to pursue a degree. And these students were willing to pay a huge premium for these courses. These courses go for close to $600 per credit hour, much more expensive than state tuition and community college tuition because they were willing to pay for that new metric of performance on flexibility and convenience, despite what we, met, we might view as an inferior product or service. And that's something that you just have to keep in mind as we kind of go through these different examples. It had to be just good enough. So the online technologies in 1989 started to get good enough at the point of, at the point that uh, University of Phoenix did try to launch their first fully online private venture. Obviously, they kind of got derailed on the Title IV and uh, uh, sort of gaming the Title IV system. But we've had already a second wave of innovation on price through places like APUS. Grand Canyon, and then we now have this new interesting uh, wave that's occurring with a low price and a competency-based ed option. And you have places like Purdue entering the ring, you have University of Michigan, you have University of Wisconsin, College for America at Southern New Hampshire University, Northern Arizona University, all of these different folks. The number, I think, of CBE institutions went up from 2014 about, uh, was it 60? or 20. Uh, it was some very small handful of people starting to dip their toes into CBE to now they're estimating about 600 over the last year. Is the innovation simpler to use, more convenient, more, more affordable? And is there a technology enabler that can carry the new value proposition up market? So here's where technology comes to play. It is an enabler. It is not the be-all, but it is an enabler. And so the way to think about this is to think about industries where disruption tends not to occur. So if you think about something like the hotel industry, and if you think about who resides in that centermost circle, you can think of like a Ritz-Carlton, you know, a Four Seasons in that centermost circle. When you think about what might be at the bottom of the market, who might be attending to larger populations of people with fewer skills, fewer, uh, fewer resources, those are those larger populations of people, something like a Motel 6 would be over there. It's very difficult to imagine a Motel 6 moving up market 
to compete with something like the Four Seasons. And part of the reason is because there's no technological enabler to help them move their value proposition up market. So if you think about what a Motel 6 would have to do in order to compete with the Four Seasons, they would have to completely refashion every facet of what they do. They would have to hire new people. They would have to invest in concierge services. They would have to build more amenities. They would have to build their rooms just as nicely as the Four Seasons would. In essence, they would replicate the exact cost position of a Four Seasons, right? And so it, up until basically the emergence of something like Airbnb, this, this industry has been immune to disruption. And in the same way, higher education has been immune to disruption because of the lack of a technological, technological enabler. And now we can argue that with the advent of online technologies getting more and more sophisticated over time, we can see that the process of disruption is starting to move on its way. And again, it's not an event. Disruption is not something that just happens to you right then. It's a process that takes place over time. The other thing is that we have to think about, is there a technology paired with a business model innovation that allows it to be sustainable? So to go back briefly um, to the digital equipment example, and I'll actually answer these two questions uh, at the same time with this example. Are existing providers motivated to ignore the new innovation, <coughs> excuse me, and not threatened? And this is something that we call asymmetric motivation. And so just to kind of go back to this graph and to go back to the digital equipment example, because I think this will help illustrate this and we'll be able to then translate this into the context of higher ed. When digital equipment was asking its customers, do you want us to build you a better, do you want us to build you a personal computer? They said, no, build us a more expensive one and we'll buy it. And if you look at the profit margins, <coughs> they were in the place to make over $100,000 in gross margins per unit. And those, those gross margins would increase as if they actually did pursue the sustaining innovation market, if they built better mini computers for their customers. When they looked down market at the personal computing market, they realized that they could really only build the computers and sell them for about $1,000 per unit. The, the gross margins on selling one personal computer might be $1,000 most at most. And what's interesting is <coughs> it made no customer sense to them and no financial sense for them to pursue this bottom end of the market. And that's what we call asymmetric motivation, is that this disruptive innovation seems so unattractive to the established competitor that they think there's no reason why I should pursue any kind of innovation like what they are building down at this market, down at the end of this market. Because if I just build something better for my existing customers or my existing students, we will be in a better position. It makes no financial sense, it makes no customer sense. Now, what's interesting is at the same time, digital equipment and IBM both had access to the personal computing technologies. They knew how to build personal computers. It wasn't as though they were completely unaware of the advent of the personal computer. They knew how to build them, they had patents. Digital equipment said, okay, if we build this into our existing model, we can make this work if we sell each personal computer for $50,000 a unit. But the units were selling for $2,000 a unit, right? So that didn't make sense within their business model. IBM, however, said, all right, we have our mainframe computing uh, headquarters in New York. We have our mini computing headquarters in Minnesota. Let's build out a new headquarters in Florida and let these folks, let this new heavyweight team figure out how do you make this work? Don't worry about maybe cannibalizing our existing business model. Don't worry about fitting it into our existing mini computing and mainframe computing business model. Let's just make it work. Is it low overhead? Is it low margins? Is it high volume? Make it work. And they did. Digital equipment, Wayne, Hewlett, Prime, Honeywell, every single mini computing company at the time that was really leading the marketplace with mini computers collapsed simultaneously in 1988. IBM was the only one to actually emerge from this because they had anticipated that it might require new resources, new priorities, and new um, processes to make this function. 
one of the things that we need to think about as we think about higher education, and this is why Paul has been actually quite successful at Southern New Hampshire University, is that he's taken this idea of fostering new growth through autonomous business units very seriously. And so what happened when he took the helm is that there was this tiny little online operation that existed, and it was mostly geared towards students who were in the Navy. And once they actually stepped on board a ship, they were no longer a student. So they were trying to figure out, how can we make this work for these, for these students? It was something that was very small, very small operations. But as they sort of explored the opportunity, they thought, let's, let's try to make this work. And that's how sort of the new online operation kind of emerged over, over the, really the last seven to 10 years. It kind of got its, it's, got, it's got its start that way. And what he did was he separated the online folks from the UC folks. The UC folks are our university college folks. And he tried to also distance the governance systems so that the faculty had a say, but only up to a point. Um, and what happened is the online operation really started to gain traction in the marketplace fairly quickly. Um, and now we have, I think, close to 80,000 students um, in a very short period of time that kind of started to take this, take this form of sort of traditional seat time based online learning. But he was very deliberate about putting them in a separate place, making sure that they had their own model to work with so that they could, so that they could function autonomously. In the early years of the online uh, uh, unit's growth, even though he could have sort of sat back and said, okay, this is good, we're, we're, we're good to go, uh, Paul decided he wanted, think, he wanted to think about what, what was next, what was the next big thing that he needed to anticipate. And so what he did was he actually built, um, he sort of created a team that was part of the original iteration of the Innovation Lab. My, my role at the Sandbox is actually sort of the second iteration of the Innovation Lab. But the first iteration was a group of people to sort of scope out what is our strategy for the future? What happens if this market goes flat? And they began to sort of think about, okay, what are the new methodologies that we need to pursue? And that really became what, what, what became called the Pathways Project. And that became College for America. And College for America is an online B2B competency-based education program that was the first to be recognized by the Department of Education for direct assessment. So absolutely no worries about seat time. Um, just prove what you know and you can move on. At the same time, the entire College for America unit was built on a very different platform because competency-based education just sort of demanded a different sort of outlook. And they built something in-house that was skinned over uh, the Salesforce CRM. And that became so personalized and customized that they actually spun that out as another autonomous unit, which is now called Motivist Learning. And so the role that I have now for Sandbox is to continue to think about even what comes after competency-based education or the sort of workforce B2B alignment and think about what comes after next. Um, and in our version of this kind of incubator and accelerator, we won't, we won't become the unit like Pathways became College for America. We will sort of push it out if it does require its own business model. One of the only other operations, there, there are very few and far between sort of operations that have been able to do this successfully, even within the business world. You can think of places like Intel, which was able to do it with their, um, with their processor market. Um, they, were able, they were able to sort of think about how do, we, how do we do sort of our Intel and the Celeron processor, the low end of the microprocessor market. Um, Charles Schwab was able to separate their online brokerage venture from their telephone and office-based brokers. Um, IBM, again, was sort of that one, uh, one of the few. HP has made a really definite effort to separate their inkjet and laser jet printer businesses. And then Dayton Hudson. Uh, Dayton Hudson is probably one of the most successful stories of this, where Dayton Hudson pushed out the Target retailers. Target now is massive and hugely successful. But there are very few companies that have actually been successful in setting up these kinds of autonomous organizational units, units to foster this kind of growth. And what this requires, and what Paul would tell you, is that it requires you to, you to build out new business models and give them breathing room to grow. Otherwise, what happens is you get 
what uh, one of my colleagues calls sausage making, who works at the University of Wisconsin. And he said this to me. He said, I'm now convinced that Clayton Christensen was right. You have to house it separately. No matter what the idea or the purity of the idea is, that is the impetus for a new idea or a new direction or a new program or a new project, because of the structure of the system, so many people have the opportunity to augment it or change it that it ends up becoming something pretty different by the time, if it ever happens, than what it started to be. And I'm sure you can all sort of empathize with that kind of process that goes through when you have to deal with shared governance and all the sorts of difficult orchestration that you have to pursue in order to get something to the next level. So here's what I would proffer to you. Um, when I think about the future of higher education um, and, and sort of all of the trends that we see, I think, uh, I think we now have, it's very simple to say that we have about 4,700 uh, degree granting, four-year degree granting institutions that are relatively expensive and difficult to differentiate from one another. And so one of the things that we identify as something that um, universities and colleges can do as they look inward is to think about what we call the job to be done. And the job to be done is this very simple concept that says that people don't just buy products or services, they hire them to do a job in their lives. And so the great marketing professor Theodore Levitt once said, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. Right? And so one product or service can um, multiple products or services can do, can perform a single job to be done and have varying levels of uh, results. But I want to just sort of highlight how this very simple concept um, really, really underscores how traditional institutions have historically performed perhaps too many or at least numerous jobs for so many different people that they might be susceptible to the same kinds of disruptive forces that newspapers encounter. So if you think about the job to be done for newspapers. Why did we hire newspapers in our lives? We hired newspapers to keep us abreast of the world's news, the regional news, what, what we needed to keep up to date on. We hired uh, a newspaper to help us find a mate in the classifieds or help us find real estate. We hired uh, a newspaper to keep us from getting bored, right? So we did the crossword puzzle or we read the comic strips. Newspapers performed so many different jobs for so many different pieces for people, but then they were unbundled job by job, piece by piece by places like Google, Craigslist, Monster.com, CNN.com, uh, LinkedIn, blogs. All of these different companies sort of homed in on a single job to be done and did it better than the, than the New York Times could even do because the New York Times was trying to play so many different parts for so many different people. And so we have to better understand why students hire higher education in their lives. What is the real job to be done when it comes to delivering higher education? And so the, today when we think about <laughs> what's going on in the labor market, in the workforce, the major skills gap really has created a new job to be done for students that centers on what we call learning to do. And employers are becoming way more vocal about their dissatisfaction of the level of bachelor's degree candidates. And what's happening is we're seeing an up-credentialing trend where a bachelor's is not enough. Even though some of these jobs never even required a bachelor's degree in the first place, empl employers are using them as a sorting mechanism to sort of suss out people who might have potential to do the job. And now that bachelor's degree is moving on to the master's degree, where that one job that may never have required a bachelor's degree in the first place, now employers are even asking for a master's degree. So students are becoming more cognizant of the need to hire a cost-effective and streamlined program that moves them ahead in their working lives. And more college or graduate school is not necessarily the answer. What we're finding is that four years on the front end of a career is not going to last a student a lifetime. We're going to need to think of ways of enabling some sort of lifelong learning mechanism to get back to that idea that I brought up where McKinsey is citing those 924 and growing number of skill sets that we need to be preparing our students uh, to, to learn at least how to learn for. So 
this was the impetus for us to write, um, for Clayton Christensen and I to write this book called Higher Education, Mastery, Modularization, and the Workforce Revolution. And what we wanted to point out was at the time, this was in 2013, people kept asking us, are MOOCs disruptive? And we kept trying to explain to them they're missing these really important markers. They haven't quite figured out their business model yet. When Udacity actually first moved it more into vocational training, we were actually excited. And we said, this is not a failure. This is actually a narrowing of, of focus here. But what we wanted to say is, hey, MOOCs are interesting. But there's this thing flying under the radar, which is this online B2B competency-based ed that's sort of aligned to workforce needs. And it's not novel or disruptive because there's new technology necessarily. We wanted to highlight that it, it, it really was the perfect illustration of this convergence of those vectors. It's the right consumers, it was the right business model, and it was the right amount of technology that was integrated into, into this model. So if you think about it, online technologies really kind of started get, first getting good enough in 1989. That's not special, that's not new. Workforce training has been around for a very long time. Competency-based education offline has been going on for over 40 years. Excelsior College has been doing this well uh, for the past four decades. These are not new, but the combination of was something to pay attention to. And here's why. One of the things is why we, we kind of understand in the abstract why competency-based ed makes sense, right? Because in our traditional seat time-based uh, learning, we are measuring butts and seats, right? We are measuring learning based on how long a student has sat in that class. And so it's not rocket science that maybe we've been measuring the wrong end of the student for far too long, right? And so in competency-based learning, instead of the learning being variable and the time is being fixed, it's flipped. You have fixed learning, the time is variable, and the pace is also flexible. And so we are now starting to understand how we can measure students' competencies uh, in terms of, you know, that will advance a student based on their demonstrated mastery. And these competencies include explicit, measurable learning outcomes that are transferable and that empower students in their lives. And here's a really important thing. Assessment is meaningful not just because it's, it's an assessment of students, but it's an assessment for students. These are real formative kinds of assessments that are not always high stakes exams. And as a result, students can receive differentiated, rapid feedback based on their individual learning needs. And these are competencies that really include how we apply and create our knowledge and do things with this knowledge. And so this is, this works for online and offline, but here's the thing that online technologies enable CBE providers to do even better. When you think about, and it was interesting listening to the speaker before, kind of talking about how at times um, the professor would just kind of vanish, right, and kind of uh, stop holding the student's hand or the student kind of felt abandoned. In this new model that, that has kind of been taken um, and copied from the for-profit industry, if you think about your roles as instructors, as professors, um, the amount of things you are asked to do as a professor, right? You need to curate knowledge. You need to teach and disseminate that knowledge, whether it's in a discussion or a seminar uh, or, a, or a lecture. Then you need to assess all of your students' work. You need to advise them. You need to mentor them. You need to also serve on committees. And then on top of all of that, you need to create new, new, new knowledge and do research. The role of a professor, professors are spread out so thinly across these, this sort of multitude of activities that they need to be on top of. But in this model, what happens is you can disaggregate. And you have a subject matter expert that actually works with an instructional design team to build the course. That is their sole job. At the same time, you have these academic coaches who, not, who do not necessarily hold a PhD who are there watching through this dashboard that is analyzing all of the big data, all of the, the students' clicks behind the scenes, and can actually analyze when the student is checking out. When do they actually have a moment where they just start checking Facebook because they're bored, or they're stuck, or something's wrong where Blackboard crashes? These things are not necessarily built on Blackboard either, but you can know from how the student checks in and out where the student is, and I can say that Molly tends to finish this module in three days. She tends to achieve a learning objective in a three-day period. 
for some reason, she's taking a lot longer this time. I'm going to call, and I'm going to find out what's going on. And again, because we're talking about these non-traditional students, many of them are full-time work, full-time or part-time workers, people with family commitments, geographical ties, all of these things that just get in the way of their learning, the coach can say, Molly, what's going on? And Molly can say, oh, it's just uh, my husband's sick, and so I have to take care of him. Or it could be something conceptual. And I just don't understand how I'm supposed to do this problem, and I just, I've done it 10 times, and I, don't, I can't do it right. That is when that coach can actually then call the tutor and say, you need to intervene. And so you actually have this much more cost-effective intervention where you can just kind of dive in only when you're necessary. And I say this coming from academia as well. I would have sometimes seminars with just eight students in the classroom. And there's this, there's this uh, tendency that we have uh, to sort of uphold this idea that, um, that in, in that in-person interaction, I will somehow know what the student is thinking. I will be able to somehow tell when this person is confused. But because of the lack of optics into the person's brain, I don't know, actually, if I'm boring the student or if, or if they're doing just fine. In this, in this model, it's a lot easier to have these kinds of optics into what the student is doing or struggling with. Um, and that is where we actually get to the point where we could potentially um, do what Benjamin Bloom mentioned in 1982, 1984, when he thought, if we could just combine mastery-based learning with one-on-one -on -one tutorial experiences, we would see this sort of two sigma variation in how students actually um, process mentally. But he knew at the time there was no way for one-on-one -on -one tutorials to actually be feasible. They weren't scalable. They were only in the realm of the wealthiest. But now with this model, we actually have ways, and it's only going to get better, where we can actually intervene at the right moment. This is just a really interesting graph to kind of illustrate why we need to also step back and think about more self-paced models. These are real students from College for America. And this is how they achieve 18 competencies. You can see how much they're on the platform, when they kind of are achieving or doing the assessments, and when they tend to drop out. They learn very differently. These are people who have so much life that can get in the way of their learning. And so, again, just sort of illustrating why this model is working so well uh, at College for America. At the same time, uh, as much as online CBE providers may be doing really interesting work, they, there's, there's room to grow. And so the other thing that online technologies do for competency-based ed is that it actually gets you to the point where you can modularize learning to really tailor to that incredible knowledge economy with those emerging skill sets that we don't actually teach well currently in our colleges and institutions. We don't offer minors or majors in some of these things like design thinking or logistics, potentially. Maybe we do, but they're few and far between. And there are going to emerge more and more specializations like this. But if you think about the way that competency-based ed breaks down learning differently into can-do statements as opposed to by subject matter, it really enables this really interesting kind of building out of a repository of competencies. So to give you an example, if you're teaching English, an introductory course in English, and this other person is teaching an introductory course in bio or anthropology, it's impossible to think of just taking a day of learning from each of those, putting them together, and having them make sense. But because competencies break down learning into these kinds of learning objectives, like can create an ethical or can create an ethical argument, or can take disparate pieces of information and formulate a research-based argument, or can speak effectively. You can do that with different kinds of subject matter, right? You can deploy different kinds of subject matter to achieve that competency. And what that enables you to do is then tailor what it is that you provide to your students in much more cost-effective and, and personalized ways. This is how, um, just to sort of get at the idea of how competency-based ed is often mischaracterized in the public eye, people tend to think, yeah, this, this sounds great, but it only works for things that are STEM-related or easy to assess by multiple choice exams, things that are quantitatively assessed. Northern Arizona University has an entire degree that is an online CBE degree in the liberal arts. They call it teaching students how to fish because they know if a student learns a specific programming language, it may go out of date, and they need to learn how to learn another one. So that is what they are trying to teach them to do. 
This is just a snapshot of the kinds of competency clusters that are embedded in College for America. Just to sort of get at this idea, it's not about training for a single job. These online CBE providers are thinking critically about liberal arts competencies and the application of knowledge from learning to know into learning to do. And it really gets at this idea that John Dewey sort of first wrote about in 1959, nothing could be more absurd than trying to educate individuals with an eye toward only one line of activity. activity. And I love this quote by a College for America graduate who talks about everything she learned about. Even though it was this kind of very condensed, B2B, non-elective, online CBE program, everyone's sort of first instinct is to say, oh, CBE is just um, vocational tech, right? This is only workforce training. This does not sound like workforce training to me. Um, and so I just thought I would share that with you as a, a sort of a personal testimonial from, from Shannon. The last thing I just want to end with um, is to just sort of explain that there is going to be a whole set of organizations that you have never heard of. Maybe you've heard of some of them, but there are going to emerge more and more that you have never heard of who are going to be your competition, and they are not your peer institutions. And these are all getting at those inadequacies of the system. They are taking a single value proposition and performing very well with it. So if you think about what coding boot camps do really well, they are getting students into these developers' role, developer roles and boasting 65 to 99% job attainment rates. That is better odds than if I were to go to law school and get a law degree. My chances would be about 57% of landing a job. And in their latest iteration, after far long after uh, when Udacity started to move into nano degrees, Coursera is now building their specializations to make them sort of more aligned to the workforce. Um, and so is uh, edX, they have their X series, right? These are pathways that really acknowledge labor market needs and the role of employers in education. In College for America, Anthem has now allowed all 55,000 of their employees to get a College for America associates or bachelor's degree for free. So the cost of these degrees are coming down so low, and they are also delivering on a very specific value proposition for these students that students can attend and pay completely through tuition reimbursement through their employers. And so although traditional schools might characterize these as not very good offerings or inferior products, we have to go back to that, that idea of being just good enough, right? Something like the Minerva Project, which is different because they're actually entering in at the high end of the market. They actually said, we're going to try to build an elite Ivy League experience for half the price. Everyone said, there's no way that someone who's thinking about going to Harvard is going to somehow go to, go to the Minerva Project. Out of their first cohort of students, half of the class was already having a year's worth of that elite experience before they decided to opt out. So these are things that we just need to, our assumptions need to be adjusted, and we need to think, what is it that is the job to be done for students? And the other thing is, if we think about these kinds of pathways that are sort of more vocationally oriented, potentially, or more workforce related, such as online CBE or these other kinds of boot camp experiences, people will say, but this is not good because this is going to further stratify our higher education system. So people who have money are going to go to the wealthy elite schools, and the poor people are going to go into Vogue Tech. I hate to break it to you, but our higher education system already stratifies in racially and by class. And so this kind of stratification is already embedded in our system. And Anthony Carnival's work really points this out quite poignantly, where if you look at the trends of freshman enrollment since 1994, 82% of students who attend the top 468 colleges are white. 72% of new Hispanic enrollments and 68% of African American enrollments are in open access two and four year colleges where completion rates are substantially lower. And so our, our system polarizes by race and by class as it channels white students into these programs that have greater financial resources as well as increased odds at completion. And so those who are actually able to access this high quality education are those who are able to afford it or have access to the right information. 
And so in order to confront this growing inequality in, in our system, we need to think about how do we raise the bar for everyone? How do we make it so that access to education is access to quality? And I really do believe that online CBE can even out the playing field by taking students to the farthest point in their learning, regardless of their starting point, race, geographical location, or family income. And so it's not to say that workforce training is the be-all, end-all of higher education, but there is this enormous, enormous market opportunity to do better in this. We have about 62% of the $1 trillion spent in post-secondary education and training and instruction that is geared toward industry learning experiences like informal and formal training, apprenticeships, certifications. There's this huge demand to, to fill, to do a better job of setting our students up for success. And again, those 91 million people who could, who we could enable social mobility by targeting those folks who are over the age of 18 and who have parents with less than a bachelor's degree. So the major takeaway is this, as much as brand names may have hold right now, uh, we are going to see that this kind of um, impulse to dismiss certain innovations that seem not good enough or things that are sort of marginal blips on the radar are actually the things that we should probably pay attention to. We need to keep in mind where those pockets of non-consumption are. And all institutions of higher education are really going to have to think very critically about how we justify our costs, how or whether we adapt our learning or curriculum to the changing demands of our students and these students who may become, who are already becoming savvier shoppers of higher education. I think no one institution has figured this out, but I don't think standing still is an option either. So in order to respond to these major tectonic shifts, we must always ask, what is the job to be done? Thank you. So who has the first question? Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, if you went back to the slide, you don't have to go back to it, the unbundled slide where it showed the um, faculty and uh, the rest of the team, the rest of the teaching team? Yeah. Okay. You know, one point I want to bring up, this is what we've done at Stony Brook in Biology Online, where we have basically separated this. So the professor is basically your subject matter expert. And then, of course, we have the instructional design and we have mentors and coaches, and the faculty actually come in and clarify after the discussions are over, mm -hmm. rather than interfering so it turns into a hierarchy in a one-on-one. -on -one. So we've basically suppressed the hierarchy in the classroom mm -hmm. kind of thing. The problem with this whole thing, though, is that this takes resources. It does. you know. And the problem is I don't see, even throughout SUNY, the answer to um, a budget shortfall isn't basically to fill it in with online. You have to reinvest in the online. Yeah. And that is the biggest piece because you need to keep this democracy, not only for the PhDs, but for everyone that is coming into this team as an equal part of the team. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that I find the most difficult to get across. Yeah. That this, this um, you need money to continue and sustain this, and you also need a democratic attitude towards teaching that is very difficult sometimes to sustain. Um, How do you ask, feel about that? Well, can I ask in your model, um, is everyone in or in a PhD program or have a PhD? Excuse me, in the PhD, and this is for undergraduates is what no, no, I'm talking no. about. The people who are assessing the ID no, team. They do no, not. They do not. Okay. No, they do not. In other words, we have the um, the assessor says a grader is completely objective person that has a master's degree that uh -huh. works with the mentor academic coach. Okay, yeah. the uh, people that are the tutors are basically undergraduate students that are mentoring students into critical thought and not giving them answers, but yeah. pushing them towards learning. So you have undergraduates in here, you have masters in here, you have people, uh, and you have PhDs in here. Yeah. It, it's, it's all a, a big mix. Yeah. But keeping that, that democracy of that, the attitude towards it, is one of the hardest things to sustain. I hear you, and I hear the um, need to actually spend, uh, to invest substantial resources into it. It's not like this is technically going to be cheaper. You know, that's not, that's not what we're trying to say. The, 
the, the, the point is that the interventions can be more cost effective, right? Um, but even when we were launching the online operations, it required a huge investment in terms of risking what we thought um, we needed to do in terms of marketing. And so what that included was we, we uh, invested substantial resources into a data analytics team, right? And so the other thing that technology is starting to do is we have so much data about our students. There's so much structured and unstructured data, um, and how do we harness that better? But if we do it better, we actually realize that sometimes students learn from one another really well, right? And we can scaffold learning in a different way than sounds right to us because it doesn't sound intuitive to us. It doesn't sound like the way we <laughs> learn, right? We learn from the stage on the stage sort of delivering their expert knowledge to us. We didn't learn that students can teach us sometimes better than the faculty member can. Um, and that's what's been fascinating. Um, I know Daphne Kohler at Coursera, they did uh, a peer-reviewed um, journal article about peer-to-peer -peer assessment and that the students were actually grading each other harder than a professor would. Um, and so um, as we've been taking more of a deeper dive into data analytics, we're realizing that um, it's not just about enabling the faculty member with uh, better cues as to when they need to be involved, although it is really helpful because they can be more precise. Um, there are ways to actually scaffold the learning so that some of those formative assessments are actually graded from student to student. Or if a student can actually teach that concept to another student, that is demonstrating competency in a way that um, you can actually record or do in different ways. And so um, I'm not saying that this is cheap, right? It's expensive. Uh, it's expensive also to just sort of um, change course like this too, potentially. But um, <coughs> Um, but I think at the same time that you may be making those market shifts into like a model that may look like this, you, there also may need to be um, an investigation of what our assumptions are about how the student actually moves through the learning process, right? Um, but yes, I'm, I'm with you. Yes? Omar, can you use the mic? Got it. If we were sitting here in 2025, from your 30,000 feet view, what do you see higher ed looking like in maybe five years, in 10 years? Yeah, so um, I believe uh, in so the future of online CBE, even though most folks who are working with online CBE are thinking about a two and a four year degree, I actually think that everything before the two and the four year degree is where we need to be thinking about because of this problem with up credentialing and the idea of a lifelong learning mechanism. That So one of the rebuttals to something like a coding boot camp is that people say, I don't want my 18-year-old going into a coding boot camp and then working for Google, and then what if five years out, they realize they don't want to be a, a developer, right? That student who made it out of a boot camp and is earning $100,000 a year is, is in a much better position to figure out what is that next learning opportunity for themselves, and so I think these kinds of activities that we do, whether we call them micro-credentials or certificates or certifications, I think there will be more, and if you go back to that modularization slide, there may be someone who just needs five competencies in order to move up the management chain, and that's all they need. They don't need a degree, they don't need to go sit in a class, um, but they just need to prove that they, they've learned what they need to do in order to, to move. Um, I think that is where we're going to see kind of the unbundling and then also rebundling or recuration. So I think universities more as kind of almost like service providers where we are curating all of the world's kind of content and the, the partners, we're partnering with more people and building these kinds of personalized pathways for students. I think that is where um, potentially our value proposition, proposition will be for, for, um, for students where we can assess a student at the front end and say, you actually have these 60 competencies and skill sets and you have this real crazy grit in you or this persistence in you that we need to sort of figure out what is it that is your goal for the future. And then they tell us like, I don't know, or I think I wanna go work for Twitter. I wanna go work for this other company. And we can actually map it out for them of what we think given our access to PLAs, to CLEP, to Udacity to edX, we can actually help build and formulate this is how you would move in that way. 
So that's kind of how I would think about it. Um, but right now, everyone is so, and it makes sense, because everyone knows that a two and a four year degree pays off, technically. But there's more and more data emerging, and I would urge you to look at Mark Schneider's work at the American Institutes for Research. Um, and uh, there's really interesting data, even from the Census Bureau, that actually shows us that sometimes if a student is actually considering going for an associate's degree only in certain disciplines, it's actually better if they go for a certification instead. Their wage earning premiums will, just, will be just much better for them in the long run. And then people say, well, that's just training for one job. But Mark Schneider's work is showing that in certain fields, in seven different states, longitudinally, one, five, and 10 years out, they're seeing that in certain cases, it is better for students to actually pursue these certifications as opposed to a bachelor's degree even. So it's really fascinating. So it's kind of getting to the idea that we may need to start packaging things in briefer, more modular ways. Yes. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, looking at the cost model, so when you look at all the stakeholders involved in providing the support, the cost model to the student also changes, correct? So if a student were in a highly accelerated environment to say complete in half the time, and somebody else who is not nearly as skilled or talented takes twice the time, what are the cost ramifications there? Yeah. So I can tell you from our College for America model for an associate's degree, students tend, and these are again full-time working adults, uh, they are getting their associate's degrees in an average of two and a half years. Um, some are taking longer, but the cost of these degrees is $2,500 a year. So it's, it's a different model, right? Um, at the same time, if I showed you kind of if you were to come and visit Southern New Hampshire University and see our Milliard operation, which is where the online, the sort of more traditional seat time based learning occurs, um, we have, it almost looks like a call center uh, in terms of the way the student, student success advising works, uh, where the students are there in these cubicles, but it's a machine that actually is tailored towards student success. And they are so branded in their mission. They know exactly what it is that they are there to do in terms of how they empower students to move forward. And these are, again, mostly 35-year-olds, I think 80% who are working. Oops. But then doesn't that also, maybe in a positive way, um, impact the assessment strategy? Because then you can kind of say, if this is a competency-based model, rather, rather than saying, I have a class of X amount of students, and the C students and the A students are all moving forward, mm -hmm. you might be able to start setting you know, boundaries for who does move forward yep. based on the competency of their performance. Absolutely. So the student who X out that degree is not going to be out as quickly, and maybe that really helps to sustain the perception of value. So what's fascinating about the College for America model is they have a very um, extensive rubric uh, system for grading, for, for assessment. Um, but the grading is binary. It's mastery or not yet. And so when a student gets the not yet, they actually feel hugely empowered to go back and do, do better and do more. And they're allowed to resubmit as many times as they want to. Um, so it does actually stagger the assessment process. Assessors are not assessing everyone's, there's no due date. Again, if you kind of go back to that model, um, of this, this, the students are submitting work at very different times, and so the assessors are not, uh, they're not doing batch grading. Uh, it's just sort of as they come. Uh, but that, that um, sort of positive psychology that's embedded in the mastery versus not yet has been uh, wildly um, empowering for students. Yes? I'm just wondering, where is the College for America in southern New Hampshire? Because I sort of became aware of it about a year and a half ago, and there was a lot of hoopla, frankly, uh, about a rollout, which was very interesting. About a rollout? Yeah, it was. Oh, so it it's was not that, open access. No, no. I mean that this was something that was just starting, and there was a lot of attention paid to it. And I know I went and talked with people in my school, and there was a lot of buzz around it. And now it's about a year and a half later, and I'm wondering 
where are you? Is it self-sustaining? Is it profitable? Is it churning money back into the original institution, as was promised to the faculty, to get their buy-in to it? Um, you know, there must be some sort of yes, there is curve, a curve that yes. you're going up. And are you at the peak? Are you still uh, so climbing? So we have close to 5,000 students now. Mm -hmm. um, because of that huge uh, deal with Anthem, where 55,000 students can now go, um, we're seeing sort of larger batches enroll. I think right now they have a month-to-month -month enrollment, just sort of the first of each month. Um, in terms of profit, no. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a mo but it is getting close to sort of that sort of mid-range level of, you know, meeting, uh, uh, meeting demand and also kind of uh, giving us hope because and that's the thing, is that Paul knows that with these kinds of innovations, they don't just happen immediately. So, and this is interesting, because I actually used to do work um, with the Gates Foundation, and they wanted me to kind of analyze their disruptive um, opportunities versus things that were more sustaining for institutions. And the challenge when you invest as a foundation in something that is potentially disruptive is that it takes three to seven years to roll out to kind of really make its way to that moment of achieving scale or whatever it is. And they just didn't have that kind of um, opportunity, partly because the higher education practice was sort of competing against the metrics that the polio division was doing at Gates, where they're curing people with polio all around the world. Those are short-term, really consequential effects. These three to seven year things were not as um, visible or obvious, right? Um, and so I think Paul realizes that and, is, and realizes also kind of how how this process is going to roll out, and it will get to that volume. So if I can just ask a little more follow-up. So basically, you're about two years along a three- to seven-year trajectory, and you're more or less along at where you would want to be on that curve? Yeah. So they are actually in the process of sort of doing their um, projections for, for the next year. And it's complicated when you do B2B relationships, because when you're working with huge companies that are really interested in you know, what we have to offer, it can suddenly go from sort of this stagnant level to another 20,000 people who are entering the pipeline. So um, in terms of whether we're happy with where we're at, we are. Yeah. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Um, so I had a question, actually, maybe two questions. I'll try to uh, roll into one. Um, I'm Stephen. I'm from the uh, COIL uh, Center that deals with online international learning uh, through technology. Uh, this question is about uh, international um, uh, international learning in a way. Um, so, so one part of it is in many non-Western societies, uh, and I come from this question having worked in uh, South America professionally in higher education, um, for several years, many non-Western societies, they have a tradition of sort of professional institutes of short-term um, uh, learning for uh, very specific skill sets in industries that are, that are um, already part of the economy in a way. And uh, in some of those societies, you see them looking at the Western tradition of more liberal arts educa education and looking back at that and saying, we need more of the um, outcomes that people bring to the economy who go through this Western liberal arts education. And how do we do that uh, in, in our higher education landscape? And, you know, uh, as a sort of add on to that question uh, or comment, uh, is how do you um, assess and um, develop some of those soft skills that? You know, employers say are so important to uh, to uh, success in a um, in a job role. How do you deal with something like international co or intercultural competency or intercultural skills um, that that we know are, are important, but that are you know, um, and we know how to assess in many ways, but they are s sort of hard to you know boil down to one activity. So the first question, um, in terms of sort of liberal arts versus more workforce oriented. I think um, I, I tend to write about this a lot. There's nothing mutually exclusive about a liberal arts competency and a workforce competency. Um, there are certain hard skills that you may have to do in, in workforce related work, but things like can negotiate with others to resolve conflicts and settle disputes, can work with others to accomplish a task, 
right, can generate a variety of approaches to addressing a problem. These are the kinds of competencies that employers, when we actually can, uh, collaborate with them to build programs, these are the things that they're identifying. And there's nothing about that that somehow makes it impossible to embed liberal arts competencies into that. Um, so we, you know, there's just sort of just less of a divide there. However, when you talk about the international context, it's interesting because we've actually deployed our work in Rwanda through Kepler University. They actually use our content with um, MOOC content as well to sort of help students um, for $1,000 a year move towards a bachelor's degree. And there is some stuff that is just more culturally American in our, uh, just in the product that we deliver. And so there are cultural um, uh, sensitivities that we need to kind of be aware of as we sort of think about the, that kind of cross-cultural delineation. But in terms of working with uh, companies, um, I think when you actually finally get an employer to be more articulate about what it is that they're looking for, it tends to be not those hard skills. It is very much those soft skills building. And so as you saw in the, in the clusters, um, you know, these are these these relate well to the workforce, despite you know being for and associates in general studies or or business management or nursing. Um, I hope that I hope that helps in terms of assessment. Uh, the uh, College for America deploys performance-based assessments, and they can be a wide variety of projects. It can include. Um, sort of an oral presentation that's that's recorded. It can include writing an essay. It can include uh, fixing an error. And you know, part of the big problem is you first have to identify a problem in an Excel spreadsheet to move forward to the next next task. It's um it's very different. They kind of have built out two major pathways in the organization where you can either do lots of small projects or one large project, uh, depending on kind of how you like to approach your learning. Oh, I think there's another. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. I don't want to, but um, you want one more question? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Vicki Sloan. I teach at a community college. Um, I've been reading a lot about CBE because um, it's. I guess it's going to be the wave of the future. I was reading an article um, where a man named Ryan Craig was yes. interviewed. I was pretty sure that your face would light up because you would know who he was. <laughs> I did not um, know anything about him until I read the article. But some of the things that um, he said were a little disturbing to me. I'm old and I'm in traditional. <laughs> I'm a traditional educator, I guess. But he talked about um, the idea that. Uh, a traditional four-year college experience is going to soon, very soon, according to him, be considered old-fashioned and elitist. And so that makes me feel defensive. And um, that what we really need to do is to stop looking at what faculty think students need and um, start educating students for what employers think they need. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you, you keep reminding us that it's not mutually exclusive to do um, traditional uh, liberal arts education along with competency-based, skilled-based education. Yeah. But um, I, I, when I hear things like that, it makes me nervous that we're forgetting about um, educating people to be part of an informed citizenry. Right. And, and I think so I come, I got a PhD in English. I, I value the humanities. I, um, the challenge is that the workforce has changed so dramatically where even getting a PhD from Stanford or getting a you know, bachelor's from Harvard doesn't make the workforce process easy. It doesn't make those skills translatable to an employer. The employer just doesn't know what to do with who you are. They can assume someone from an elite Ivy League experience is smart and capable and probably can learn what they need to learn. But what about the millions of students who didn't have that kind of experience, that proxy for that kind of learning? So, and again, to kind of go back to the idea of um, uh, liberal arts uh, competencies, um, there really is, again, sort of nothing exclusive about making something that is more aligned to workforce needs 
and liberal arts competencies. There's no reason why you can't embed one into the other. So if you think about what Brandman is doing, they built a Bachelor's of Business Administration. The entire core 60 competencies at the, as sort of the, the core of the degree is all based on AACNU and LEAP initiatives that are liberal arts competencies, right? So they are not saying that even though they are you know, working with Fortune 500 companies, and sort of delivering this pipeline of students to them. They're not saying that this is just sort of training for that one job. But you also have to remember, it's so hard to get that first job now in the economy that, that we live in, that sometimes it's OK to also get the students into the first job, because then they also learn the workforce competencies. And if they kind of take part in this lifelong learning mechanism, they're also going to continue to learn more competencies that will get them into their second job and kind of move them into their third and their fourth job. So it's not about training them just for one job, like a dead-end job. And there are certainly middle skills jobs like computer numerical control, like the CNC machine operators, high paying but dead-end, right? So that's a difficult thing. But people tend to take those kinds of skills and say, this is all you're doing when you, when you sort of help students for the workforce. You're training them for dead-end jobs. These are not dead-end opportunities. There are so many middle skills opportunities and career pathways and burning glass technologies has this amazing report where it even shows how if you start in retail, we, we tend to think like, oh, our newly minted bachelor's degree candidate is now working at the gap. What have we done, right? We haven't set them up for success. That actual job in retail leads to these really amazing pathways in logistics and um, accounting and management. And they show these kinds of career pathways that don't just end in those dead end uh, dead end roles. And so there just needs to be more nuance around how we think about workforce related education. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. You're very welcome. Okay. So